Hi, and welcome back to my videos for General Chemistry 1. Today I want to tell you about the work of some of the earliest chemists of the modern age. These are the people who used what we now call the scientific method to study interesting compounds like gases. Before their work, chemistry as a science didn't really exist. Instead, people studied alchemy, which was the attempt to purify naturally occurring materials and find ways to use them. That sounds very scientific. Chemists tried to purify and find uses for materials too. However, alchemists tended to be very secretive. They were always afraid of having their ideas stolen by competitors, so they rarely described their discoveries in a realistic way. Plus, their work was clouded by mystical beliefs, including the idea that certain materials could give a person immortality, and it was the search for those materials that motivated a lot of alchemical research. Even worse, the notes kept by alchemists were often vague and imprecise. It wasn't until the 17th century that people studying compounds began to take more careful and well-written notes, and to use the scientific method to test their ideas and develop theories to explain what they saw. The person who's often regarded as the first chemist was Robert Boyle. Boyle actually was an alchemist and believed it was possible to transform less valuable metals into gold, which was something alchemists had been trying to do for hundreds of years. But he also took careful notes and designed experiments with controls, and he was particularly interested in gases. It had only recently become possible to make airtight containers you could use to study gases. Here's one that Boyle invented and used it in his experiments. He built it with the help of his assistant, Robert Hooke, who also went on to discover many properties of springs and pendulums, which you'll study if you take a course in physics. Another of Boyle's inventions was the first accurate device that could measure the pressure of a gas. You're probably familiar with barometers, which we use today to measure air pressure. You may even have one in your home, and you'll see the barometric pressure reported in weather forecasts on TV. Before we can talk about what Robert Boyle did, it'll be helpful to talk about what exactly pressure is. Pressure is the force that results when the molecules of a gas collide with the walls of a container. So when there are more particles, or when they move faster, the pressure is higher. On the other hand, if we were to remove all the gas until there were no molecules, the pressure would be zero, and that's what we mean by a vacuum. What Boyle invented wasn't a barometer. Instead, in 1660, he invented something called a manometer, which was an earlier version of the same kind of instrument. A manometer is a U-shaped tube that's sealed at one end, and the tube contains mercury. On the sealed end of the tube, there's a vacuum, so there's nothing, not even air, on that side. The other side of the tube is connected to a container of gas that we want to know the pressure of. Since this gas is guaranteed to have a higher pressure than zero, the pressure on the left side of this tube will be higher than on the right side. That means the mercury on the left side will be pushed down by the pressure of the gas. The higher the pressure, the farther down the mercury will be pushed. If we put a ruler between the two arms, we can measure the difference between the two mercury levels. The higher the pressure of the gas, the greater will be the difference between the heights of the two columns, and that's a great way to measure the pressure of a gas. It turns out that if we use a manometer to measure the average pressure of air at sea level, the difference in height between the two columns is 760 millimeters. For that reason, the unit we use when we measure pressure is millimeters of mercury, or mmHg. Another unit we use for pressure is the atmosphere, which is the pressure of air at sea level. So, one atmosphere is equal to 760 millimeters of mercury. By the way, in the United States, weather forecasts usually give the barometric pressure in inches of mercury instead of millimeters. It turns out that 760 millimeters is equal to 29.92 inches, so that's the average air pressure at sea level. When the pressure is higher than that, the weather tends to be dry and clear, while lower pressures tend to be more humid or rainy. As we'll see soon, pressure is one of the most important properties of a gas. It can tell us about how many gas molecules are present, how fast they're moving, and even how much they weigh. 
For that reason, many chemists of the past studied gases and their pressures very carefully. One of those people was John Dalton, who we talked about way back in the beginning of this course, in video number two. Dalton was especially interested in mixtures of gases. For example, the most important gas for life on Earth is air, but air is a mixture of many different gases. Dalton wanted to know, does the pressure of a gas behave differently when the gas is made of more than one compound? It turns out that each gas in a mixture exerts a different amount of pressure on the walls of our container. The overall pressure is just the sum of the pressures for each gas. So, if we have gases called A, B, C, and so on, the overall pressure is given by this equation. The individual pressure of each gas is called a partial pressure, and this equation is known as Dalton's Law of Partial Pressures. So, for example, suppose we have a sample of air whose pressure is 2.30 atmospheres. The air consists of 2.61 moles of nitrogen, 0.97 moles of oxygen, and 0.044 moles of argon. Those three gases really are the three main ingredients of air, although air has lots of other gases in much smaller amounts, including CO2 and water vapor. Now, let's calculate the pressure that each of those three gases exerts on the container. The total pressure depends on the amount of gas, and that's what the moles tell us. So the first thing we need to know is the total number of moles. When we add the moles of each gas, we get 3.62 moles total. Now that we know that, we can find the pressure for each individual gas. For example, the pressure of the nitrogen is just the fraction of the overall pressure due to nitrogen. The fraction of the gas that is nitrogen is 2.61 moles divided by the total moles. And we multiply that by the overall pressure. That gives us 1.66 atmospheres for the nitrogen pressure. If we do the same thing for the oxygen and the argon, we get 0.62 atmospheres for the partial pressure of oxygen, and 0.028 atmospheres for the partial pressure of argon. Getting back to Robert Boyle, one of the most important discoveries he made is that the volume of a gas is inversely proportional to its pressure. In other words, if we double the pressure, the volume goes down by half. This is known as Boyle's Law, and we can express it this way. P1V1 equals P2V2. In this equation, P1 and V1 are the starting pressure and volume, and P2 and V2 are the pressure and volume at the end. The only thing to be careful about is that the units we use for pressure and volume have to be the same at the beginning and at the end. So, for example, if we measure V1 in liters, that's also what we need to use for V2. For example, if we have 2.54 liters of a gas at 985 millimeters of mercury, and we then drop the pressure all the way down to 390 millimeters of mercury, what will be the final volume? In order to find out, we'll just plug all this data into Boyle's Law. The thing we're trying to determine is V2, so we'll solve for that. When we do, we get a result of 6.42 liters. Notice that it wasn't necessary to convert millimeters of mercury into atmospheres. As long as P1 and P2 have the same unit, it doesn't matter what that unit is. As Boyle's Law predicts, the volume went up when the pressure went down. So, Boyle's Law tells us the connection between pressure and volume. Gases can be very difficult to study, so it took over a hundred more years before people figured out the connection between temperature and volume. That was done in 1787 by the French chemist Jacques Charles. One of the reasons it took so long was because new technology had to be created first. And just four years earlier, a brand new invention was made in France, the hot air balloon. Hot air balloons may seem like simple devices, but they were very new at the time, and it was the first time that human beings were ever able to fly in the air. 
It was an exciting development, and you can see the crowd of people at Versailles in this drawing who came to see one of the very first hot air balloons. As you might know, the air in a hot air balloon expands when we heat it with a flame. That reduces the density of the air inside, and that's what makes it float. Jacques Charles realized that this means there's a connection between a gas's temperature and its volume. It turns out that the volume and the temperature are directly proportional. That idea is known as Charles's Law, and we can express it with this equation. V1 over T1 equals V2 over T2. One thing that's important to note is that in this equation, the temperature must be in Kelvin. It doesn't work if you use Celsius temperatures. If you're not familiar with Kelvin as a temperature unit, you should take a look at the previous video where we talked about it. For example, suppose we have a hot air balloon with a volume of 955,000 liters at a temperature of 55.2 degrees Celsius, and we then increase the temperature using a flame to 78.1 degrees Celsius. What will be the new volume of the balloon? We'll use Charles's Law to find the answer. We're looking for V2, so we'll just plug our data into the other variables. But remember, we need to use Kelvin for the temperature. Celsius will give us the wrong answer. As we saw in the last video, we convert to Kelvin by adding 273.15 to the Celsius temperature. So we're starting at 328.4 Kelvin and ending at 351.3 Kelvin. I'll also convert that large volume into scientific notation, just to make it a little shorter. When we perform the calculation, we find that V2 is 1.02 times 10 to the 6 liters. So, as Charles Law predicts, the volume went up when we increased the temperature. So Boyle's Law tells us how pressure and volume are connected, and Charles's Law tells us how temperature and volume are connected. There's one more gas law that I want to tell you about today. In 1811, the Italian physicist Amadeo Avogadro, the same guy that Avogadro's number is named for, realized something interesting about the volume of a gas and the number of molecules in it. First, he realized that the volume of a gas is proportional to the number of particles. That's called Avogadro's law, and we can write it this way. This symbol means proportional to. And the n here is the number of atoms or molecules in the gas. Usually, we measure that in moles. The other and much more surprising thing that Avogadro realized is that the volume of a given number of gas molecules is the same no matter what the gas is. So if you have a million molecules of water, it takes up the same volume as a million molecules of helium or carbon dioxide, as long as the pressure and temperature are the same. This is actually a really surprising discovery, and here's why. Suppose we have a container full of hydrogen. If we could suddenly replace all the hydrogen with propane, it would take up the same volume even though the propane molecules are much larger. So a mole of hydrogen, a mole of water, a mole of propane, or a mole of any other gas all take up the exact same volume even though they're all different sizes. Well. That's all for now. In the next video, we'll tie together everything we learned about gases today, and we'll use it to find out lots more about what gases are like. We'll get lots of practice using all these gas laws in class and on the homework, so we'll talk much more about it when we meet. Until then, have a good week.